Hi everyone, good afternoon. My name is Alex Cooley. I'm the director of the Harriman Institute here at Columbia. And it is a great pleasure uh, to welcome um, you and everyone who's gonna be watching a video of this to Russia host the World Cup, sports and politics in 2018. And this is in cooperation with the School of Journalism at Columbia, as well as our partners at NYU uh, the Jordan Center, um, in which we run a uh, Russia public policy series um, sponsored by the Carnegie Corporation and their generous support. Part of the goal of what we want to do in these series is bring together communities that normally don't come together, right? Especially when it comes to sort of studying Russia and Russia's contemporary importance and issues. And this being a World Cup year, uh, we thought um, this is actually a great opportunity to think about how prominent professionals and leading professionals in their field think about the World Cup, right? So for some, it's um, sort of a sporting event and a spectacle, uh, but for others, it's an occasion to sort of explore its uh, use politically. Uh, for others, it's an activist opportunity. For others, it's a nation branding <coughs> opportunity, and still for others, um, it's a chance to explore uh, political and social history. So there's lots of stories about the World Cup. And what we thought by sort of having this in February is to give a heads up to the audience sort of as you're watching and enjoying the games, of course, without the U.S. this year, that part of it did not, did not go right. Sort of in Moscow, I drank a toast to Panama a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> Um, but nevertheless, um, uh, um, to sort of have you aware of all of the kinds of background things that are going on behind the scenes and to foster what I hope is this interesting and fruitful dialogue. Um, I think there's a, a particularly important moment here in which, um, you know, I, I, I don't know if I'm sort of tainting the discussion, there doesn't seem to be all that much enthusiasm for the World Cup as you would expect in a World Cup year. Certainly not the enthusiasm that there was prior to the Sochi Olympics, so maybe we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, or there's sort of concerns about uh, security, right? That's on the mind uh, of a lot of Muscovites, or you know, renting out their apartments. Yeah, that could be another thing. Um, but there's not also a lot of enthusiasm about the team either and its prospects. And so I don't know if this is leading to sort of a lowering of expectations or I don't know, perhaps this is related to the upcoming uh, major sporting event, which are the Winter Olympics and Russia's exclusion as a team from them um, for anti-doping violations, right? Um, so uh, the World Cup will be Russia's opportunity to reintroduce itself in the world, right? Put itself on the map, try and get some of these scandals and other experiences um, out of the way and move forward and sort of spotlight itself to a global audience. So uh, the format, we have three uh, leaders in their perspective fields. Um, all, you have the full bios online. I'll just mention some highlights of all of them in the direction, or rather in the order that they're going to speak. Uh, so first we have uh, Natalie Koch, who is associate professor and a Hanlon faculty scholar in the Department of Geography at Syracuse's uh, University's Maxwell School of Citizenship and Public Affairs. And she is a political geographer who focuses on geopolitics, nationalism, and authoritarianism in the post-Soviet political space and the Arabian Peninsula. And she's particularly interested in geopolitical analysis of world events, um, spectacles, sporting events, uh, urban planning, and uh, other expressions of state power. She is extensively published in leading academic journals and author of the forthcoming book, The Geopolitics of Spectacle, uh, uh, which is coming out with Cornell University Press later this year. Uh, then our uh, resident practitioner, or she's not resident, but, but she's here in New York City, uh, Jane Buchanan, who's the <laughs> Associate Director of Europe and Central Asia Division at Human Rights Watch since uh, 2005, she's conducted research and advocacy on human rights issues in Russia and other countries of the former Soviet Union, including on topics like police violence, media freedom, property rights, disability rights, and children's rights. And she, Jane is uh, particularly qualified to share her expertise here because she has focused on human rights campaigns that have targeted 
large global events in this part of the world, uh, including the Eurovision Song Contest in Azerbaijan, uh, the 2014 Sochi Olympics, um, using these events as opportunities for targeted messages uh, and advocacies. And she uh, 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 joins us uh, a few years after we did a similar panel on Sochi, um, and, and that was uh, uh, quite enlightening back then. So welcome, Jane. And then finally, last but not least, uh, Gabriel Marcotti, who's a senior writer at ESPN, a columnist for the Times of London and the author of four books. And Russia 2018 will be his sixth World Cup, and he has written extensively about soccer and culture over a 20-year career. Um, he holds uh, a BA from the University of Pennsylvania and an MS uh, from the School of Journalism here at Columbia. He lives in London. So thank you for joining us. In fact, he moved his show to a studio in Connecticut um, <laughs> so he could be with us here today. So welcome home, uh, Gabriel, or welcome thank back, you. rather. And thanks so much for joining us. So I think the format will be, we'll uh, go in uh, uh, that particular order, about 15 to 20 minutes each. Then maybe I'll ask a couple of follow-up questions, and we'll open it up uh, for questions from the audience. Just a couple of notes. Uh, this is on the record, right? So if you have any kind of obnoxious or nasty things to say, um, you know, try and craft them in a way um, that's uh, uh, rated okay. Uh, and also, we'll ask you to introduce yourselves if you do ask a question, um, just for the record here. So, uh, Natalie, the floor is yours. All right, thank you, Alex, for that wonderful introduction and to Harriman and NYU and all the other sponsors uh, for this invitation. It's really uh, wonderful to be here and to speak to such a diverse audience uh, and to be on such a diverse panel, specifically because sport is something that brings together so many different audiences but we don't often think of it in, uh, in a lot of academic fields as critically as we might. And so this is something that I have been endeavoring to do in the last, uh, in the last years. So what I want to talk to you today about is a little, a little bit broader than just Russia, but try to set the stage and think about why we see these sorts of sporting spectacles, and specifically in uh, illiberal countries or authoritarian countries, whichever uh, designation you would prefer. So um, what I want to sort of start with is this puzzle of why Russia is hosting uh, the World Cup. What sort of benefits does it have for investing very large sums of money into putting on this particular event? What is the appeal uh, of this uh, this coming, the coming games this summer. So there's a really long tradition historically of using major sporting events, sometimes you'll hear them referred to as mega events, uh, to broadcast a particular image of a country and specifically an image of that country as particularly modern. Uh, so this is not something new. This has a very long history, uh, specifically with the World Cup as well. As you know, the um, Maracanã Stadium was built initially for, for the first time that Brazil hosted uh, the World Cup. And that was uh, an important way for Brazil to put itself on the map. Uh, but we also can, can think of other examples, uh, for example, the Nazi, uh, the Nazi Olympics in 1936, in which the stadiums and the portrayal of the city itself was extremely important uh, for broadcasting a particular image of Nazi Germany as orderly and as particularly modern. So, with that sort of context, what we're seeing today, or what we have seen in recent years, is the uh, perhaps intensification of a number of these sorts of projects. Uh, if, if not intensification in number, perhaps intensification in terms of dollars that are being put into developing these large spectacular stadiums and large spectacular events. Uh, so just a few examples up here of recent uh, recent games and stadiums that have gone up for, for these particular events. But increasingly, so we have a few, a few cases here that might be considered liberal polities, um, but in a number of places around the world that are considered demo democratic states, they are becoming increasingly wary of various mega events. So there were large scale protests in response to Vancouver's hosting of the 2010 Olympics. Uh, there was also a large scale protest in opposition to various evictions that were happening around the, the London Games. 
in 2012, uh, certainly extensive press coverage of uh, various relocations of favela communities in Rio for the, uh, for the World Cup and also for the Olympics. Uh, and we can also think even a little bit further back to a liberal polity, uh, Canada, that had had its, um, well, the Olympic experience soured uh, the, the Canadian opinion, I think, on some of these mega events, as the Montreal Olympics stadium was only paid off uh, a couple of years ago, in fact. Uh, and so as countries have seen the effects of some of these events and the elitism of a lot of the development that goes into putting them on, uh, more, there has been more and more pushback against that. And we can see that just one s small example of, of uh, protests in Boston to get uh, Boston to withdraw its bid for the Olympics in recent years. So as these liberal polities are increasingly getting wary of this, they're very much, and this is a response to citizen opposition in large part, um, but in context where perhaps there isn't such a venue for citizen opposition, uh, such as various authoritarian states, they, we are increasingly starting to see some of these events moving to those places. And I think the examples of, of um, the, the games in Sochi and also the coming World Cup are just a few examples of that, but certainly also another country where I do research is Qatar, uh, which will be hosting the next World Cup after that, and um, as, as well the, the bids for the 2022 Olympics, in which most of the candidate cities ultimately pulled out, and so you had only these three, Beijing, Oslo, and Almaty, and Kazakhstan, uh, in the running, and the games then went to Beijing. So we are starting to see a rise of these mega events going to authoritarian states, but I think the important caveat that it's only some of these authoritarian states. Not all authoritarian states are prepared to do this. Um, so the question to me as a geographer is, which countries, which authoritarian states are we seeing this happening in and why are we starting to see this shift? And it's not just because there are certain personalities that like, uh, like sports and are promoters of that. You know, we obviously can see some influence there. Uh, in some of the cases I will talk about as well, they quite, quite like sports. Uh, but nonetheless, we can't necessarily just kind of say, okay, it's Putin's vision uh, and this is, this is what he is interested in. What I, how I approach this question, why we start to see certain authoritarian states that host, is first of all, they have to have the financial resources to do this. Hosting some of these events is extremely expensive. Uh, but more than that, sometimes we see various sort of um, flows that might not, be, uh, might not be so readily apparent in terms of those finances, and I'll get to that. But these states also have to see a degree of political utility for, uh, for using these particular events. So the question is then, um, what sort of political utility are they seeing and why, or how can we think about Russia in this particular context? So in my research on sports, I'm thinking about it in terms of geopolitics, uh, but also thinking about that in terms of the urban level of uh, why we see these sort of events. And specifically, linking back to that idea of these stadiums as a way uh, to promote a particular image of the country, we see that uh, a great deal of events are connected to this idea of using that event to promote a particular uh, iconic image uh, within the city and to project that image internationally. Uh, so internationally, this, that sort of audience is to project uh, or to brand the nation or the city, to put it on the map, as they say but also has a domestic purpose of using uh, these sorts of events for nation building and generating a degree of pride. Uh, but another important element to this domestic utility of these sorts of projects is the distribution of patronage. And I'll talk about that a little bit more specifically what I mean by that. Just a few examples here again of, of recent uh, cases. As, it, as Alex mentioned, I have been working in the Gulf countries, and we see a, an intensive use of these kinds of events across the Arabian Peninsula, but specifically in uh, Qatar and the UAE, where they have been trying to host a number of elite sporting events. And that sort of elitism is quite, quite important to that image of modernity that they're trying to project. Uh, so in my research on the Cycling World Championship, 
Championships and on FIFA World Cup uh, that's coming in 2022 in, in Doha, among other sorts of spectacular icons in Abu Dhabi, like the Yas Marina, uh, which is a Formula One circuit where you can park your yacht if you want to watch the race. Um, uh, you know, so this is a sort of elitist project. So in, in thinking about what's happening in the Gulf states, the, this is not isolated, right? The rest of the world truly is watching what is happening in these contexts and how they are using these kind of events to promote a modern image of the region and to reshape the image of the Middle East, for example, and to try and narrate that as progressive and modern and open to the world and international sport is a particularly convenient way to demonstrate exactly that uh, when perhaps you are working against a stereotype that is quite contradictory. So these, uh, these cases are, are quite exceptional, but we can also see that many of the, many of the other places where I do my research on Central Asia, the leaders there are very much looking at what's happening in the Gulf states. They are traveling to the Gulf states. They are sending teams to these events. They are watching how this is operating there. And they are, in many, in many ways, replicating a number of those things. However, they've not been as successful in getting some of the top tier events. Uh, many of them have been more successful in getting the sort of what I, what I call the second tier events. Um, so for example, you can see a number of them listed up here uh, on, on the screen, uh, but also just kind of the introduction of these first European games in Baku in 2015, uh, where the government spent billions and billions of dollars into this event that hadn't previously existed. Uh, and much of that money goes to things like the, the spectacular new stadium there. The top one is a rendering, uh, and below that is um, President Aliyev with it. So we see this happening in, in Azerbaijan, we see this happening in Astana, uh, and similar situation here where Kazakhstan has not been able to get some of these top tier events, uh, but nonetheless has been able to get some of the, the lower tier events. So in 2011, they hosted the Asian Games jointly between Astana and Almaty. Uh, and this is you know, another example of a, of a president who is, is a sports fan and has always stated his desire to host the Olympics. But just stating his desire to host the Olympics isn't enough to make it happen, right? Um, but that said, all of those in his inner circle are well aware that they need to do basically everything they can in order to make that, uh, his, his hope, his ambition, come to life. Uh, and that is a way of advancing their own prestige within that inner circle. Uh, and I can talk a little bit more about that, but th this is one of the reasons that we see this intensive push in a place like Kazakhstan uh, where the leader has expressed his desire for this. But just expressing a desire, again, isn't sufficient. Uh, you have to start to, I think the attitude in, in a number of these countries is to build the infrastructure, build the stadiums, build all of those things that are needed to make your country competitive to get one of these bids. So we see that certainly in the preparation for the Asian Games in Kazakhstan, uh, in the construction of a number of venues like the Astana Arena here. And if you look at who is funding these and who is building these, uh, these structures, you can start to see a little bit of what is happening in terms of the political economy of these sorts of projects. Uh, so Sembol Construction Company is headquartered in Turkey. Uh, it is more or less an open secret that it is backed by the or owned by uh, the Nazarbayev family. So this is a way in which the Kazakhstan government, as you see, the, the official numbers, if you look this up, you will find that the Kazakhstan government put this money uh, from its own budget to, to build this stadium, and it goes to Sembo Construction in addition to a number of other sort of international firms here. Uh, but importantly, that money is going to foreign bank accounts. Okay. Uh, we see a similar thing in this sort of complex that, that Kazakhstan built in preparation for the Asian Games in 2011 uh, at the Astana Ice Skate Center, also funded by the Kazakhstan government, also funded by the Sembol Construction. And Sembol Construction is really responsible for almost all of the iconic structures across Astana. Uh, and likewise here we have the, the Republican Velodrome funded by uh, a different sort of branch of the Kazakhstan government, the uh, um, administration of the president, and, and built by Mabitex Group. And for those of you who are familiar with any of these construction contractors in Russia, this will be a familiar, uh, familiar name. They're involved in a lot of really big construction projects across Russia, headed by uh, former president of Kosovo. 
And Bureau 71 is another one of these sort of shell companies that it, it exists on paper, but I, I can't trace anything more to it uh, beyond that. But an interesting thing about this sort of project is that it clearly did not uh, take $82 million to build it. It is completely unfinished. Uh, the, if you walk to the rear of this structure, it is falling down. Uh, you might be able to see, let's see if I can, this is the ticket booth here, uh, and it's not finished at all, and it has weeds growing on top. Top. Um, so these are the sorts of projects where you can see large sums of money going from the, the state budget to these various companies that are headquartered uh, outside of the country and connected with some of these elite networks. So, Turkmenistan has been doing a similar thing. Uh, they have been trying to develop, or they have been developing, actually, a slip to, flip to the next slide, uh, this Olympic city. So this is a, a rendering of this, of this particular complex, a multi-billion dollar complex. And they call it the Olympic city, but it's clear that Turkmenistan has, I would, say, I would argue, no realistic chance of ever getting the Olympics. Uh, but nonetheless, the government has justified it through, uh, through the, the hosting of this past summer, these, um, these particular 2017 games, which weren't really the full Asian games. If anyone was following this, it's just the indoor and martial arts games. So here in these contexts, we see that they're using these second tier events uh, to, to justify a lot of this construction, to use this to, uh, to develop these large scale projects which are highly elitist and similar to Kazakhstan, uh, that money is going to certain firms, specific firms that are again headquartered uh, offshore. So Polymex is one of the biggest uh, construction companies operating in Turkmenistan and also headquartered in Turkey. And you can see, well, maybe, maybe you can't see here, uh, but you can, uh, you can see on, from their website all of the major iconic projects that they are getting, including a number of sports complexes. So these are uh, important ways to link back to the point I made before of distributing certain patronage uh, to, to figures that are connected to, uh, to the government and to justify this sort of development with reference to the idea of hosting an international event, of bringing international attention to the country and to promoting this image of being modern. So sort of linking this back to Russia then, uh, and with this sort of close, yeah, we'll be closing here. Uh, when I'm thinking about spectacle, I, I think it's really important to keep in mind that when we think about spectacle as sort of celebratory spectacle, that it cannot be divorced uh, from the punitive side. So celebratory spectacle is this sort of use of awe and wonder on these big events uh, like sports, where you're creating this positive image of the government government or you're trying to promote this positive image of the nation. But these things go hand in hand with other forms of punitive spectacle and what we also sort of scholars think about as structural violence, uh, that reinforcing structural inequalities within particular uh, countries. So in, um, in the context of Russia, I think this is really important where we see that intimate connection between uh, trying to use or to, trying to play up this positive image through the use of celebratory spectacle and together downplay uh, the, um, the, the attention, the international attention, and I'm really looking forward to what Jane has to say about this, uh, to try and downplay that sort of punitive spectacle or structural violence. The other point I think to take, take away from this, this general introduction here is that when we think about authoritarianism and what it means to be uh, thinking about global sporting spectacles in an illiberal world increasingly or otherwise, uh, that authoritarianism unfolds at a lot of different scales. That we can't just think about that at the state scale uh, where, where you know, we, we are looking at a picture of Putin here, you know, looking at the renovation of the stadium that it is not just about him, it is not just about authoritarianism in Russia. Yes, that is part of the issue, uh, but it is also something that we can see unfolding at a number of other, in other places and spaces around and through uh, global sports. So 
recent uh, r recent revelations about FIFA or just FIFA as an entity is a rather authoritarian structure. It is very, very uh, closed. It is not transparent, and it is, in many ways, I would argue, a rather um, a rather good example of how we understand authoritarian governance. Okay, so that coming together uh, makes it quite important. And similarly, when we think about authoritarianism at the urban scale, we can also see how a number of these events are kind of uh, used to run over certain democratic claims to or cl claims to have a voice in the urban fabric and the transformation of a particular city uh, because the event is then used as a way to shut down oppositional voices. And lastly, I think this is one of the most important points in thinking about uh, these, these particular events. Often when outsiders are looking at them and looking at these elitist projects where you have you know, a, a multi-billion dollar stadium or something that is just completely outrageous and everybody says, oh, well, they're never gonna get their money's worth. Of course they are not. The people are not, but somebody always does, right? So no matter what happens to these stadiums afterwards, those construction companies were paid. There are certain individuals who got their paycheck, and that doesn't necessarily mean that they have any vested interest in what is going to happen with that stadium afterwards. So I think this is a really important thing to, to bear in mind when we say, ah, yes, it's a success or it's not a success, that y often it is a success for certain individuals. And so the question then becomes, who are those individuals and where are they located? Thanks. Super, thanks so much. Jane. Hello, sports fans. <laughs> <laughs> um, so thank you so much to Alex um, and the Harriman Institute and NYU Jordan Center and everyone for being here. Um, so I'll just start with a few words about Human Rights Watch to, um, to bring us all into the same page about who we are and what we do with our work. So Human Rights Watch is an independent, non-governmental, non-partisan organization that conducts uh, research in over 90 countries worldwide. We document human rights abuses um, and expose them and press, try to press for change to improve uh, human rights protection. We have about 400 staff with offices around the world. Our funding comes exclusively from private foundations and individuals. So our programmatic work is divided into uh, regional divisions that cover the major geographies of the world. I work in the Europe and Central Asia division. And then we also have thematic divisions um, that work on topics like children's rights, women's rights, business and human rights, LGBT rights. But obviously there's a huge amount of overlap um, between what's going on in geographic divisions and in thematic divisions. Um, we do not have a sport and human rights division, although um, there's quite a lot of work uh, within the uh, regional divisions, uh, especially in Europe and Central Asia, since there seems to be a great proliferation of countries in our region who want to host um, mega events and mega sporting events. Um, but we're bringing in the work of our, of our thematic divisions very much as well, um, because it's always or very often relevant in the work that we're doing. So the methodology that we use in our work around the world is the same. We conduct um, in-person interviews with victims and witnesses of human rights abuses. We analyze uh, international and domestic law to understand what types of human rights violations are taking place. And then we publish reports where we um, expose what's happened using uh, personal testimony from those who have experienced violations and make recommendations for what we see uh, that needs to change in the policy or legal framework to prevent those human rights abuses from happening or to remedy those that are already happening. So we've been uh, doing research related to sport and human rights uh, for more than 10 years. It's hard to believe. Uh, to, to just give you a sense of what this has included, um, this began, our work began, I think first and foremost, ahead of the 2008 Summer Olympics in Beijing. Uh, then, uh, more in our region, the uh, 2015 European Games in Baku, Azerbaijan, obviously the 2014 Winter Olympics in Sochi, Russia, the uh, 2017 in Asian Indoor Martial Arts Games in Turkmenistan, um, and then now ahead of the FIFA World Cup in Russia and the 2022 uh, FIFA World Cup in Qatar. 
Um, so in all these cases, we're, we're looking at um, exactly these issues of um, the punitive side of these events um, that Natalie spoke about and the structural violence, which we would basically um, just call human rights abuses. So our advocacy um, stems from really the documentation of human rights abuses that are taking place in the context of the preparation for these games or these events. Um, and then using that uh, as um, you know, the basis for pressing for change, showing exactly what kinds of abuses happen in the preparation for these games. Um, so pressing for change among the government hosts as well as from the sports federations who, um, are, who own these games, who are also responsible for putting them on, and who themselves benefit tremendously. Um, so I'll mostly be talking today about um, our work um, in Russia and our advocacy with the International Olympic Committee and FIFA. We also have done work with uh, national level committees and federations, as well as the regional groupings that, um, that are involved in some of these events, like the European Olympic Committees, that was responsible for the European Games, and the Olympic Council of Asia. Um, in this advocacy, we very often partner with other organizations, and I'll describe that in a little bit more detail, um, how that works and how that um, affects our ability to have impact. So I think overall the work that we've done and the impact of this advocacy has been very mixed. Um, these are some of the most entrenched and repressive governments that we see, certainly in our region and around the world. Um, but overall I think we have seen in some, change, some changes in the way that sports federations view their role in human rights protection um, and promoting human rights. Um, again, we're dealing with some of the most um, complicated, non-transparent, um, in, in many ways, um, you know, as many media reports and, and other uh, evidence has shown, corrupt organizations, um, but as long as they're talking about human rights, we're going to keep pushing them to deliver. So what this looks like from the ground for, for a researcher, um, so in terms of, of our work in Sochi, for five years in the run-up to the games in Sochi, we were on the ground documenting uh, the range of human rights abuses <clears throat> that were going on there. So there are sort of four or five broad categories. Um, the first is exploitation of migrant workers who are engaged in construction on Olympic venues and infrastructure. Illegal expropriation of property uh, and forced evictions to make way for Olympic venues and infrastructure. Harassment of activists and others speaking out about environmental or other issues related to Olympic preparations, um, including the imprisonment of an activist. Harassment uh, and detention in some cases of international and domestic journalists trying to cover um, social issues around, uh, in addition to their coverage of the games. And um, I think as many of us know, in 2013, just about six months before Russia uh, was going to host the Olympics, Parliament adopted the so-called anti-LGBT propaganda law, um, which established um, you know, a shocking level of discrimination and, um, and <laughs> I'm not sure of the right word, um, sort of the, the, the absolute sort of counter um, narrative for, for, an, for a country that's just about to welcome the world, right, and welcome everyone to see um, the Olympic Games. So similarly, in the um, oh sorry, did I <laughs> um, in the run up to the uh, World Cup in Russia, um, we've done similar work to look at abuses against uh, workers on six World Cup stadiums. We found many of the same abuses, unfortunately, as we did in Sochi. This is non-payment of wages, severe de delays um, in payment of wages, refusal to provide workers with contracts. Uh, making any recourse for workers uh, virtually impossible in the event of a dispute. They wouldn't be able to prove their employment relations in a court. Um, and instances of insufficient health and safety protections. Uh, there were media reports which we found to be entirely credible of forced labor by North Korean workers on the St. Petersburg arena, including one worker who died. And the Global Trade Union Building and Woodworkers International has documented 20 deaths on World Cup stadiums. Um, another uh, interesting element of our work uh, in this documentation in the run-up to the World Cup was the detention of one of our researchers um, as he sought to interview workers near the Volgograd Stadium in April of last year. 
He was approached by name, um, and uh, it was very clear to us that he had been surveilled and that the authorities were waiting for him. They knew what kind of work he was doing. Uh, he was released after charge for, without, sorry, without charge after a few hours, and he's pursuing now um, uh, legal process against the actions of the police. And um, the other major issue that we're seeing, and I think we'll see it more certainly in Russia in the run-up to the elections, but also in the run-up to uh, the World Cup, was arbitrary detention of peaceful protests, protesters, including individual picketers, people just you know, on the street, on Red Square, with a poster advocating for something or the other. Um, there was a presidential order that was developed to create uh, security protections, allegedly security protections. I mean, some of those are certainly obviously necessary um, to guarantee the safety of everyone coming to the World Cup. Um, but what we saw was the uh, over-interpretation and overuse of these restrictions ahead of the Confederations Cup last June, which is sort of a one-year um, an event that's hosted by the World Cup host country one year in advance, so it's sort of the warm-up. Um, so in that way, if there, that's any indication, I think we're, we're very concerned about the potential for more detentions. We documented 33 cases of arbitrary detention, but um, are confident that there were unfortunately more. So as I mentioned before, the research that we do, um, we are bringing it to those who have power to influence and change the situation. So with respect to Sochi, um, we were working uh, quite a lot with both the IOC uh, and the Russian government to the extent possible to, uh, to try to get some change you know, before, the, before the games were, uh, were done um, and in the run up. Um, so in October 2013, I think a little bit of an unprecedented um, sort of idea we had was to invite some IOC officials t with us to Sochi. Um, because uh, in all of our meetings and correspondence, there was a real sense that, um, you know, sitting in Lausanne, it's really impossible to understand, you know, what these, what the real issues are, what this is like for a human being um, in the pathway of, a, of an Olympic event. And, um, you know, despite, like, great efforts with multimedia and video and photo, there's just something that can't be communicated um, unless you're, you're actually um, seeing those people. So we spent the better part of a day with two IOC officials uh, visiting different locations and individuals. And then soon after, uh, together with a Russian human, organiza human rights organization, gave the IOC a list of 600 workers who uh, had alleged the payment of wages. So, um, unbeknownst to us until after it was all done, um, in December 2013, the Russian authorities undertook a large-scale labor investigation uh, into workers' rights on Olympic infrastructure and stadiums and uncovered over eight million U.S. dollars in unpaid wages uh, on Sochi sites. So, uh, you know, that was uh, a little bit too late for a lot of those workers who had already been, had already gone home, a lot of whom had actually been deported uh, before the, that inspection took place. But, um, you know, it was a real uh, moment of confirmation that uh, there were serious problems and that the Russian government, um, you know, had the, cap had the capacity, if the will was there, to, to investigate um, and, and remedy these problems. So um, at the same time, we were doing a lot of other work on, with, with other allies um, to encourage the International Olympic Committee to put in place reforms uh, for future Olympics <coughs> that would prevent these types of abuses from happening. I mean, what we saw in Sochi, those types of abuses that I, that I listed um, were almost um, you know, one for one, the same things that we saw ahead of Beijing uh, 2008 Summer Olympics. So there are sort of clear and known risks when uh, governments are hosting these types of events, when there isn't sufficient um, rule of law or um, mechanisms of accountability within the country. So there's been, um, you know, over the years and on different topics, different countries, <clears throat> a lot of coalitions and groups uh, working together. <clears throat> there's been um, a huge amount of flip, flip, flip flexibility and mobility, um, which I think has been, you know, really um, powerful in many, in many ways to, to achieve change. So we've seen groups organizing over, um, you know, with expertise in a specific country, for example, in Azerbaijan or Turkmenistan, 
um, broad coalition of groups um, advocating for LGBT rights ahead of the Sochi Olympics, groups focused on press freedom, you know, all of everybody coming together around uh, these events or uh, around a certain advocacy target, so the IOC or FIFA. Human Rights Watch belongs now to the Sports and Rights Alliance, which is an international coalition that includes human rights groups, uh, anti-corruption groups, trade unions, and uh, advocates for athletes and players. And I think what we can report, again, without um, you know, diminishing the challenges or everything that needs to be done yet, um, there have been some really positive steps. Real change that I think really um, five or six years ago um, in the run-up to Sochi we couldn't have even imagined. So for example in December 2014, so thinking this is the same year as Sochi, so a few months later, the IOC approved an Olympic Agenda 2020 um, that specifically called for better human rights protections including um, specifically for host cities and um, that human rights would now be a requirement of host city contracts and in the bid process. So there, there was a focus on issues like gender equality, non-discrimination, um, and respect for basic rights as defined in UN treaties. So it, it's, pretty, it's pretty sweeping. Um, the principles are enshrined now in the 2024 host city contract, um, and that contract was the first one to be made public, because obviously transparency is a huge part of understanding what's being done um, and how to hold, as a, it's a tool for activists to be able to hold um, governments and these federations accountable. We have to know what, what they're saying, what they're agreeing on, and how, how countries are committing to deliver on their obligations. Um, so in the shadow of uh, the major corruption scandals at FIFA, you know, FIFA's leadership came forward to try to put a new face uh, on the institution. Um, and one of those has been to uh, promote human rights. So in 2015, FIFA commissioned a report by a leading expert on business and human rights, uh, John Ruggie, who some of you may know, he developed the UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights, which is sort of the standard that companies and other private enterprises are expected to, um, to be held to in their operations so as to protect and prevent human rights abuses. So on the basis of this report and the recommendations, uh, FIFA re revised its statutes to include a specific reference to human rights. They incorporated human rights requirements into the 2026 World mm -hmm. Cup bidding process and um, did some things internally. They created an actual position of a person responsible for human rights and established an independent human rights advisory board mm -hmm. that has a number of, of really leading experts on this. And then just uh, last year, ha developed and published a human rights policy. It was right around the time as uh, we published our report on uh, conditions in Russia. Uh, and the policy commits, its to, it commits uh, FIFA to promoting human rights across its whole operations. And with respect, so the protections that FIFA's put in place in the host city, yep, um, have not, do not specifically apply to Russia or Qatar. Those were contracts that were signed prior to these commitments. Um, but nevertheless, we've seen FIFA um, take some steps in Russia. So they announced that for the first time in 2016, they would be conducting labor monitoring, condition, monitoring conditions of labor on stadiums built for the World Cup. Um, so this is significant. They are partnering with um, Russian trade unions um, and others to, to carry this out. Um, however, based on our research, we uh, identified a number of shortcomings, which you know, hopefully should inform future uh, efforts if they're gonna continue to do this. Um, so the first one, um, it may come no surprise for an institution like FIFA, is basically a total lack of transparency or public information about the nature of this monitoring system um, and what types of violations they found, where, where they took place, what remedies have been put in place uh, to um, resolve that particular situation or prevent future ones from happening. Um, there's nothing really about the methodology of, of the monitoring. So it's very, so we're basically expected to take FIFA's word for it, that they have a great monitoring system in place and it's working. Um, so, you know, the message really to them at this moment is that in order to be credible and for external parties to be able to hold you accountable, um, 
you need to be much more transparent about this. Um, I mean, some of the other just technical shortcomings, uh, the program appears to be limited only to the stadiums, but as we know, preparations for events of these size require not just stadiums, they require massive infrastructure investment in transportation, communication, housing for athletes and others. Um, so in many places, um, you know, there's going to be, you know, huge amounts of labor uh, engaged in, in those sites that seem to fall completely out of, out of FIFA's current system. The monitoring also based solely on announced visits, so employers know in advance when they're going to happen. And we certainly encountered workers who um, had not been able to speak with monitors who uh, were on their sites. Um, I mean, the other, the other piece of our research that I think can inform this monitoring is that there, there have been really frequent strikes, or at least in the run-up, to, to the research that we did, frequent strikes on a number of these sites, um, you know, suggesting that pro in strikes on sites over many months, you know, suggesting that some of these problems really are not being resolved um, or the monitoring isn't turning them up. So in the future, we'll be um, obviously continuing to engage in FIFA on, on Russia. Uh, Human Rights Watch as an organization uh, through our Middle East division has done a tremendous amount of work on Qatar uh, together with other organizations to highlight um, the real human rights concerns that are in place there. Um, and I'll just close with just a few words about the media and where this fits into um, you know, the campaigning that, that we want to do. So um, you know, as we know, Governments of all sizes uh, really want to promote these events um, as, you know, the opportunity to show them their country to the world, to show progress, modernity. Um, it's also a time when there is a, an incredible amount of media attention uh, on these countries and on places like Azerbaijan or Turkmenistan that may not be in the global media very often, um, if at all. So we try to, uh, again, to sort of capitalize on this to the extent possible, again, in exposing these, these concerns um, as, a, as a means of um, encouraging those who can make change to do so. Um, we've seen that our investigations and fact-finding can uh, contribute to reporting because in many of these countries, journalists um, have a lot of difficulty uh, doing their work freely, and especially around the actual hosting of the events. We've seen a lot of restrictions, um, a lot more um, surveillance um, and monitoring of journalists in doing their work. Um, so the extent that our reporting uh, can, can give them leads or ideas um, or just contribute to their own reporting, um, we've tried to, to do that as much as possible. Um, so yeah, I think that you know both activists and the media um, are going to be really crucial in making sure that what the sporting federations have committed to really does um, bring change. And that as we see, if the trend continues, as we've heard about, that um, illiberal countries are seeking out these institution, these types of events, um, that institutions like activists locally and internationally um, and the media can have a really important role in holding them accountable. So, thank you. Thank you. Gabriel. Good evening, and uh, I think as Alex mentioned before, uh, I'm delighted to be back uh, at Columbia, having gone to grad school just across the road. Um, and as an aside, just in case people end up Googling and wondering how I got here, I should point out that I'd last seen Alex in AP art history class in, in high school. <laughs> um, so we do go way back. Um, Full disclosure. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but in the interest of transparency, which That's is right. obviously a word here we're using quite a bit. So we're going to offer a little bit of, of context to this. Um, as we've heard, we've heard about liberal nations, authoritarian nations. Um, attracting these big events. Um, it's partly, undoubtedly, in a real politic way, it's, it's, it's for the reasons uh, we heard. There's probably another shift, I think, that goes along with it. And as far as the World Cup is concerned, uh, I sort of thought back to the last time the World Cup was hosted by what we would call a, an authoritarian regime or, or a polarizing regime. And you probably have to go all the way back to 1978 in, uh, in Argentina. So really, 
in terms of the, the world football, world soccer community, uh, this is kind of new, what we're dealing with, with Russia and Qatar. In between, we've had, we obviously had Brazil and there were issues there, but there were generally was a universal, universal likable support for, for Gilma, the government in, in, in Brazil, clearly South Africa, again, issues there, but everybody was excited about a World Cup in, in Africa. For that, you had countries like Germany, like Japan, and Korea. We didn't really face these issues because we had, uh, I think, governments that most of us in the West are very comfortable with. Um, and this is very different from the Olympics. Uh, let's be clear on this, because we heard about Beijing, but let's not forget, 1980, Moscow, the height of the Cold War. We, you know, there was a massive boycott, 84, LA. It went back, uh, went back the other way. So as somebody who operates in the football world, chronically in the football world, for us, this is kind of uh, a new conversation that, that, um, that we're having. And it should also be stated that I think as far as FIFA and the countries that, that make up FIFA and, and sort of the, the power politics of world football, it was a closed shop for a very long time. It was something that was dominated by Western European nations and by Brazil, Argentina, and Uruguay in particular in, in South America. Uh, they hosted, those two sort of areas of the world, plus Mexico, hosted every single World Cup uh, until that was broken in 1994 when, uh, when the World Cup was held uh, right here in the United States. Um, Part of the background to this, part of the background to, to wanting to break this, this sort of hegemony of Europeans and South Americans had to do with what happened in the early 70s when um, a man named Jean Havelange, a uh, Brazilian, became president of, uh, of FIFA, largely with the support and, and the promise of opening up the power structure to, to the rest of the world. To, he did it with overwhelming support from Africa, from, uh, from parts of Asia, um, and from, from CONCACAF, which is sort of the, the body that includes North America and, uh, and Central America and the Caribbean. Uh, with that, and, and his sort of uh, right-hand man is Stefan Fetchett, who would later replace him as, uh, as FIFA president, is a man you may have heard of, Sepp Blatter. Um, people now say disgraced before him, although I think it's news just of today that he's suing FIFA to, to clear his name. Um, Blatter turned everything around. He actively pursued and, and courted um, those parts of the world, largely in the developing world, but not only in the developing world, that were often left out of the power structure of, of the game, even as the game became richer and richer. He started these programs uh, whereby FIFA would uh, effectively transfer money in the form of grants for football development, often with no questions asked. And when people talk about the culture of, of corruption, it kind of is a man with a large pot of money handing it out and not asking too many questions. He's not necessarily actively involved in the corruption, but he doesn't go and check to see what you do with it. Um, and I think We've all described it as a FIFA scandal, um, what, what happened in, in 2016 with the, the Borolak and the early morning arrests and everything. It is a FIFA scandal to the degree that FIFA set up a system that was enabling. But it should also be noted, and give this a little bit more, that the, the actors in this were operating locally, mostly actually in South America and right here in, in CONCACAF. And those are a lot of the people that we're seeing indicted. They were indicted for things that had nothing to do with FIFA per se, but they were enabled by sort of the system of, of patronage, this lack of transparency, uh, that this, this, this culture that, that FIFA basically set up, this ecosystem of corruption, which doesn't apply in every single confederation. There are some that have generally managed to steer clear of this. Um, to give you an idea of this, and this is still one of my, my favorite steps, you may wonder, well, how did Russia and Qatar get the World Cups? Now, part of it has to do with sort of a legitimate desire to say, well, we've never had a World Cup in a, in, in a former Soviet country in Eastern Europe, uh, and we've never had a World Cup in, in the Arab world, or indeed even in a, in a Muslim country. Um, and it also speaks to shifting power bases and geopolitics, because the Russian economy was, was 
was very strong at the time of the bid, um, driven by energy. Uh, and of course, Qatar as well. Qatar still believes the wealthiest country in the world per, ca uh, per capita. Still, you gotta go and vote on this. Now, FIFA has something called the Executive Committee, which again, if Sepp Blatter were here, he would say, every single member on the Executive Committee isn't chosen by FIFA. They're all chosen by the individual confederations. If they send us a bunch of people who are corrupt or corruptible, it's not my fault. But as I said, he helped create, or FIFA helped create the ecosystem where characters like Chuck Blazer, Jack Warner, and others could thrive. But in any case, so 24 members on the FIFA Executive Committee, and they need to pick in one go who gets 2018 and 2022. Of those 24, two get banned prior to the vote because they get caught in a media sting with somebody offering them millions of dollars to vote for um, whatever candidate it was. Six are subsequently banned um, and received lifetime bans on charges ranging from vote selling to more garden variety corruption. One, Julio Grandona uh, from Argentina, passed away before he could face charges. I'm told you you can't really slander a dead person, so I won't go any further than that, but you can do some Googling on him. Uh, a further seven have been indicted, either in the uh, US-led uh, FIFA investigation or separate investigations. Uh, and one is currently, this is kind of funny, one is currently under investigation by FIFA's ethics committee, and that man is Vitaly Mutko. Vitaly Mutko is the deputy prime minister of Russia, uh, until very recently, he was head of the 2018 Russia World Cup Organizing Committee, uh, former Russian Minister of Sport, former head of the Russian Football Association, and he's also the guy who received a lifetime ban from the International Olympic Committee because of the, uh, of the doping scandal that you might have heard of. So, if my math is correct here, um, out of uh, 24 people, 17 have faced let's say, or been found guilty of, uh, rather serious accusations. So you get a sense that there was nothing clean about this 2018 and 20, 2022 process. Uh, there were certain rules to how this was done. There was a certain way of doing business. You might have heard again with Russia about how when, um, when FIFA did an, an investigation afterwards, there was an independent investigator, um, for example, they tried to access the hard drives of their computers, and they said, no, oh, well, we can't do that. Why? Because, well, we, we rented all our computers, and we gave them back to the company that leased them to us, and they just happened to destroy them all. And it's a lot of nonsense like this. But really, I think, apart from the Belgium-Holland bid for 2018, and Japan, and Korea, Japan, oh, sorry, to Japan 2022, uh, the other seven, including the US bid, had some serious ethical questions to answer for. So we need to bear in mind this is sort of the way of doing business. It's not just the strange, faraway countries that operate this way. Um, a little bit of background again on, on FIFA and why they're sort of in a jam right now. Um, obviously, after the scandal, they, they had new elections. A man named John Infantino was, uh, was elected. He's a Swiss lawyer. Uh, he was previously the, the general secretary of UEFA. And he kind of ran on a platform, which I don't know if he's listening, but I'll summarize it, paraphrase it like this, which is, guys, no more stealing, no more corruption, because if we run in a transparent, business-like way, we're all going to make more money from sponsorship, from commercial rights, and we're all going to be better off. And I will prove it to you by pledging $5 million to every FA over a four-year period. And we're going to raise this money because we're going to be clean and transparent and we're going to be hugely profitable. Look, I did it before when I was a Secretary General at UEFA, which is the, the European Confederation. Um, time will tell whether you can live up to that promise. But uh, it's important, I think, because when it comes to Russia 2018, the outlook isn't quite so rosy. We heard a little bit about some sort of general lack of enthusiasm. There's certainly a lack of enthusiasm from, uh, um, from sponsors. FIFA are projecting that um, their sponsorship revenue is going to be flat relative to 2014, uh, this time around. 
I'll give you another example. The domestic television rights for the World Cup in Russia that you would have expected would have been sort of locked down a long time ago. Uh, they were only sold uh, last month in, in January, some six months before the competition. There are sponsor slots that are still in, unfilled. And, you know, again, Russia blames FIFA because they're asking for too much money. FIFA is saying, well, actually, people aren't excited to go to Russia because Yekaterinburg is a, is a tough sell for our sponsors. Whatever the case may be, um, this is not going to be the runaway commercial success that, that people, um, uh, th that people uh, expected. And to give you an idea also, the kinds of sponsors that are being roped in, um, many of them are from Qatar, from, of course, are flush with cash and are kind of <laughs> on board the bandwagon for 2022, and from China, who are hoping to host uh, down the road, perhaps in 2030. And uh, the most recent high-profile sponsor is something called China Menu Dairy, which is the official supplier of drinkable yogurt and prepackaged ice cream. Um, Again, we're talking about a global sponsor that doesn't operate outside of China. So again, you kind of get a sense of they're sort of pulling people in wherever they can. Um, and I think in general, there is a lack of enthusiasm here. We, we heard before about Vladimir Putin and, and the effort that he put into, uh, into sport in securing uh, the World Athletics Championships in 2015, obviously Sochi 2014, um, the World University Games which were in, uh, in, in Kazan. Um, certainly the impression I get is that Putin's own enthusiasm now is running out. One of the issues that they face, one of the reasons that they're behind, um, this is what I've been told anecdotally, um, but I, we're on the record, so I'll, I'll couch it properly, is that unlike Sochi, where you know, they had to get it right and it had to be done, and no matter the expense, which offers a wonderful opportunity for all sorts of graphs and, and corruption, because I can sell you that $10,000 uh, toilet seat. The government's been a lot tighter this time around. They basically said, this is your budget, this is your schedule, you go and make it work. Um, and when people thought, well, it's gonna be like last time, let's just keep, keep asking for more money, the government said, uh-uh, no more money, you make it work. And that's why we've had, or one of the justifications that, that were given to me was, this is why we've had corner cutting, this is why we've had um, certainly some migrant worker uh, abuses, a situation in, in St. Petersburg with a stadium that had to be rushed in was absolutely horrendous. Um, in fact, if I recall correctly, those North Koreans who worked there, they weren't just North Korean, they were, uh, they were North, members of the North Korean military who had uh, but no real choice but, but to be there living in, in deplorable um, uh, conditions. Um, the other context to this, and might be another reason why Mr. Putin doesn't seem to be very excited to be a part of it, is the Russian national team is extremely bad right now. The Confederations Cup in 2017, they, uh, last summer, they failed to get out of their group. Uh, they're the lowest ranked um, of any of the 32 countries in the World Cup. Um, and another reason, fair play to Putin, might be this doping scandal, which hasn't touched the, uh, the football team, yet, in fact, the joke is that maybe the, they should have been doping, otherwise they wouldn't have been so terrible. Um, but it's obviously touched Vitaly Mutko, the gentleman I mentioned before, who was a longtime booster for uh, Russia 2018, um, and very close, he still is the deputy prime minister of, of, of Russia. Uh, obviously, 26 Russia uh, medalists from 2012 and 2014 have been stripped of their medals. and. You know, while the official line has been, you know, well, maybe mistakes were made, but we're clean and football's clean, you can also kind of see how, you know, Vladimir Putin might like to kind of step away a little bit from, uh, um, from what's going on. Um, one other point about football in Russia, especially as often depicted in, in the Western media, um, they've, they've had many issues in the past with, with racism. Um, with violent hooligans. Uh, you can actually do this afterwards. You can go on YouTube um, and look at Euro 2016 in Marseille when uh, a group of highly trained, I think it was 35 or 40 Russian hooligans, basically martial artists, decided to 
to go and, and wreak havoc in the city of Marseille, attacking French fans and, and English fans. And one of them very helpfully had a GoPro on him so he could film himself while, uh, uh, while beating people up. And incidentally, I'm not a security expert, but this, I think, raises another misconception, and you guys would all know more about this, about Russia, where it's depicted as an authoritarian state where everybody knows everybody's business. If you're Russian and you want to go to Marseille, you need a visa to, to, to expatriate. On top of that, in Russia, as in most countries, um, people who are hooligans and are, they're monitored by the police. They know where you live, they know your movements, uh, and whatever else, especially, you would assume, in a country like Russia. Nobody's been able to give me a good answer about how these people were able to get out of Russia, go down to the Cote d'Azur, wreak havoc in Marseille, and then all get home safely. And the conspiracy theorist in me suggests that maybe they had some help from, from some people in power. Either that, or maybe the Russian government sort of isn't quite as authoritarian or as effectively authoritarian as we're often uh, led, to, uh, uh, led to believe. I'm going to leave you with some reasons to be happy and hopeful about Russia 2018, so it's not just a complete bummer. Um, <laughs> so first of all, there's a long history of worrying and gnashing of teeth and pulling of hair before tournaments. Um, we had it in 2014, we had it in, uh, in, in Brazil, in 2010 in South Africa, where you know, the crime was such we'd all be macheted to death. We didn't have it in 2006 because that's Germany and they're more efficient at everything. But, um, but, but there, is, there is a history of these, these scare stories. Um, I, I also think one other aspect is I think maybe perhaps having the government a little bit less involved and the fact that this tournament becomes less of sort of a big propaganda mission for the might of Russia might actually be a positive, um, at least to, to the sporting spectacle. The other thing is I was there at the 2017 Confederations Cup and we were all on the lookout for issues of, of inefficiency, half-built uh, stadiums, um, hooligans, episodes of racism. Now, knock on wood, but it didn't happen. Now, that could be because it was limited to Sochi, Kazan, uh, Moscow, and St. Petersburg, which are obviously more, more modern, better uh, cities with better infrastructure, maybe better policing. Um, but they were able to pull that off efficiently and without incident. Now, the, there weren't great crowds, especially Russian crowds, because the Russian team was so bad. And there's no telling what's going to happen. There's no telling who, what kind of a fan wants to travel to the World Cup to go to Nizhny Novgorod when they don't speak the language and can't read Cyrillic, and it's going to be expensive. But at least they show that they can pull off the, the junior version, of the very junior version of the World Cup without any, any negatives or, or, or any major incidents. Thank you. Thanks very much. So there's a, a ton of thing I would like to ask all of you, but I'm going to try and, 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 and restrain. But I, it, it was very curious, um, very in, not curious, very interesting how all of you brought up FIFA, right, as an explicit part of this. And Natalie, I love this idea of sort of FIFA itself is governed as an authoritarian organization, right? It's untransparent, it's gone through this evolution. Yet, sort of from Jane's presentation, I took FIFA to be really your main advocacy target. I mean, I, you know, in, in a lot of this, I mean, obviously you're operating at multiple levels, but you really do feel that the organization itself is, 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 is prime for, you know, naming and shaming and change and, and then these types of tactics. And then sort of gave, gave, gave us this blow-by-blow blow account of everyone on the committee who, who bid on these, um, uh, the successful bid for the 2018-2022 you know, uh, Olympics. One interesting aspect of this regarding Putin was when the FIFA scandal broke, he really seized on this to complain about American extrajudicial global power, right? Um, in other words, the real scandal for him on this, when sort of the indictments and the investigation wasn't so much the corruption, it was, here's another example of American hypocrisy and double standards and the U.S. asserting itself in everyone's business by sort of evoking this extraterritorial um, sort of dimension. So um, I'm, I'm very curious as to how you view in your sort of respective sort of domains the relationship between host regime 
and FIFA, right? And, and, and sort of, you know, how much of this, um, you know, are there vulnerabilities there um, in terms of sort of, you know, naming and shaming? Um, you know, Natalie, have you seen any uh, kind of evolution in which sort of FIFA is taking on some actual um, you know, regular organizational kinds of structures, the way sort of, you know, Jane sort of talked about create these committees and these, these, these kinds of things, or is it just sort of adapting to sort of camouflage its own uh, kind of agenda? And then, and, and then Gabriel, on, you know, I'd love, I'd love to get more thoughts on you on how much in terms of when you're giving background this summer, is this sort of FIFA relationship to the bid to the host, how much is that gonna be part of the packages? that you produce, or is this something that, you know, at the end of the day, you're not gonna get into this um, because we're gonna concentrate on, on the sports and, and, and so forth. But, but I'm curious, FIFA really seems to be central to all of your uh, presentations here. So maybe just go down the line. Natalie, do you wanna take it first? Sure. Yeah. All right, thanks. Uh, yeah, so I, I, I like the juxtaposition that you point to in terms of FIFA as, as running as an authoritarian system and as, a, uh, as an advocacy target. And I, I would say that that's, that's quite predictable in, in, a, in a number of ways, right? That if you want change, if you're thinking of us in terms of an opportunity to affect change, uh, then surely what are the mechanisms that that's going to happen that means um, working with an institution and trying to get it to, to open up and make some small change, some window of opportunity. And I think that's certainly what uh, the power of, of these sporting events is, and, and Jane touched on this quite well. Uh, but that, that's also a way that you see authoritarian systems open up as well. I mean, think about uh, sort of the, the press opportunities and the, the transformation of, of the Soviet Union with Glasnost. I mean, this is, this is a, a, common, a common way, but certainly using that platform to um, to transform that I also particularly like um, Gabe's point about uh, sort of going back to this question about how we how we understand the relationship between the host regime and FIFA uh, of, of the ecosystem right uh, and and this is I think something that's quite quite useful in thinking about the separation between authoritarian system and a non-authoritarian system or an institution that's complicit or not complicit uh, nobody wants their dirty hands right uh, so if you can set up a system where it looks like you have have nothing to do with that ecosystem, um, or you know that this ecosystem may be mine, uh, but I was I wasn't responsible for those bad actors. I think that delineation, is specifically, it's 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 always muddy. We can always say that those territorial borders, as Putin is touching on, they're they're always fluid and they're always false, but certain actors are invested in promoting that image that they're completely separate. Um, and, and I think that's something that you certainly see uh, with, with an organization like FIFA, the IOC, but also in my research on, um, on cycling and the UCI. It's the, same, it's the same sort of story where you can say, okay, well, it's, it's the, the host's problem. That's their, their ecosystem. Um, and, and try and, and pull back from that and keep your hands clean. Yeah, very interesting. Thanks. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, I mean, I think you, I think you make the point exactly that you know one of the things that we are trying to do is exactly break down this barrier um, or this uh, this idea that it, that a sports federation can be completely separate from the countries that are hosting uh, its events. Um, you know, and in terms of, I guess maybe, you know, Alex, if you're trying to sort of provoke, you know, why can we be optimistic about FIFA, um, particularly in light of Gabe's um, presentation? You know, I think about the first meetings that I had with the International Olympic Committee in 2009 or 2010, and this was an institution that um, really didn't think about human rights, um, didn't, you know, wasn't in their vocabulary, didn't think it had anything to do with them, didn't think that they had any responsibility other than to work with the host country to deliver, um, you know, the best sporting event that they could. Um, you know, Gabe knows a lot about FIFA, but I'm sure we could get someone else in here to talk a lot about the ins and outs of an institution like the International Olympic Committee, um, its lack of transparency, um, its systems of patronage, um, and the like. Um, and so then to see, you know, a few years down the road, 
um, some major transformation. I mean, obviously, the rubber has to meet the road yet. Um, but um, so, you know, I think that that, you know, for people who work in human rights, we're going to be optimists <laughs> always. We have to, we have to be in order to go to work every day. So I think seeing what that there was change possible in the IOC again with a new leadership that came in, um, with Thomas Bach, who you know kind of staked a lot of his reputation, his early reputation with the International Olympic Committee on these kinds of reforms. You know maybe there's a moment here with FIFA. Um, you know, to see the same again, you know, without diminishing at all the challenges. Um, and I do think that, you know, we're, we are in this for the long game and what we do in every country, whether it's China or Russia, uh, Qatar, to show the abuses that are happening there, you know, we're also trying to get these institutions to change so that there won't, there won't be more of these. You know, there, there actually will be um, the leverage that these institutions do have, the power and the money that they do have, to leverage that as a force for good. Um, that these games can be something more than just, um, uh, you know, a great event with empty stadiums, you know, left behind. Um, but that, yeah, and that they aren't exploitative um, at the bottom line. Very interesting. Okay. Um, yeah, on the back of that, and I think what we, the IOCs, who, in my opinion, was in far worse shape than, uh, um, than FIFA 15 years ago. Um, the strides that they've made, I think, can be really encouraging. But again, I'll make two points, both cynical, one of them maybe slightly um, with a positive upswing. But um, one is that, you know, FIFA, even before Johnny Fantino came in, FIFA had all sorts of good governance, anti-corruption experts go in, file reports, mm -hmm. uh, Alexandra Rag, mm -hmm. uh, before her, this other guy, uh, Peace, Mark Peace, I think is his name. Um, these long things about this is how you need to reform your organization to cut out this and that, and these very clever people worked on it. But then they wouldn't go anywhere. And it's not because there's some central institu FIFA institution. I think the leadership of FIFA said, even before Infantino, that this would be good if we could implement this stuff, we'd get more credibility. But ultimately, as one, in fact, one of the few executive committee members, you can probably figure out who it is, who was not um, indicted or implicated, said, ultimately, we have a problem of democracy here. We have 211 um, FIFA members. We've got more members than the, than the United Nations. And the president rules by simple majority. And if you go through this, the standards of good governance and democracy and openness um, in the vast majority of these countries are lower than they are at FIFA. So we're in a situation where we can have these highfalutin sort of Western European and sort of Swiss values about, um, about good governance, but the people who are voting don't view it that way. They have a much more cynical mindset. Um, and in fact, that's one of the reasons why part of the FIFA statutes is that any federation where that's found guilty of political interference from its government um, is automatically suspended. Uh, that's done specifically because so that you don't have, you know, some mad authoritarian dictator in some country deciding to go and, and name himself onto the national team, for example. But the flip side of that is you're always going to have this problematic relationship with the real world and, and, and with politics. The other point, and I found this quite jarring when I first heard it, when I was in, uh, in Qatar uh, this time last year, um, I met with somebody who was a, who was a friend of a friend who's senior Qatari figure, not involved in football. But he is somebody who cares about, or says he cares about workers' rights and whatnot. And he said, you know, next door to us um, is Abu Dhabi and Dubai and the Emirates. And they have the exact same worker protections that we do, which is very little. Um, and people work in terrible conditions there. Um, in Saudi, they're even worse. And if we'd never gotten the World Cup, the same number of people would have been dying, but they wouldn't have been dying building stadiums. They would have been dying building shopping malls and highways and whatever. The difference is that you wouldn't be here and nobody would care, um, which I thought was quite jarring. And then I sort of, it occurred to me that, you know, maybe this is the weird silver lining that we have here, that we're focusing on, on Qatar, and rightly so, but there's obviously a much broader issue there. 
And in some ways, football, we can't expect football to solve it, but we can expect football to be a way of making people more aware, and then hopefully it'll percolate down so that, you know, uh, <laughs> It's not just the guy building the stadium or the infrastructure for the stadium, but you know the guy laying down blacktop also has those same protections. And it may be wishful thinking, but it is a, a baby step, I think, in the right direction. Oh, great, super. Okay, so let's open it up for some questions. So just wait for the microphone to come to you and just uh, tell us uh, who you are and your institutional affiliation. So yes, in the back. Yep, Justin. Uh, I'm Justin Burke. I'm a reporter for a news website called Eurasianet. Uh, that covers the former Soviet Union. I want to pick up on the uh, two, two things. One, the, uh, the spectacle as a image crafting experiment, and the other as Russia as the weakest team in the field for this cup. Does these two factors create the conditions for an image crafting uh, train wreck and what in, in which the host crashes out and fails for the first time, I believe, to make the second round. And what would be the implications for the authoritarian trend for hosting? And what are the economic implications of this, too? Yeah, thanks, thanks for that. We actually haven't made that connection yet, right? The connection between sort of what happens in the arena and how that rebounds on the regime and the prowess. And Sochi was about you know, the medals table and performance and so forth. So how does that affect the whole image branding sort of idea? Natalie, you want to take Okay, so we're not pulling, just go for it. Or, or, or okay. whoever, whoever wants oh, to take it. Oh, no, I just want to say, just, <laughs> yeah. just to, on, in terms of the host nation not going to the next round, it's happened before. It's happened twice, actually. It happened to, to if I'm not mistaken, Japan in 2002 and certainly South Africa in, uh, in, in 2010. And you have this sort of collective depression. The reason I think Russia might be a little bit different is that the expectations are already so, so low going into it. And I think there's another factor. And obviously, Russia's a big country, and football's a really big sport. But the impression I have from, from the time I've spent there and my visits there is that it's not a national obsession the way it is in, in, in Brazil the way it was in, um, in, in South Africa or, or, or Germany. So I think in some ways they would, they would deal with it a little bit better. And again, the bar's been set so low right now that um, you know, I, I don't think it would have a major impact. Yeah, so thanks for the question. Uh, I, I will be particularly interested to see how Russia fares against Saudi Arabia. I think that, that, that matchup is, is in itself quite interesting. Uh, but, but my response to the, the imaging project overall and its relationship to the success of the actual team, I think for, first of all, it's really important to ask success for whom? You know, which audience are we talking about here? So if you're thinking about the domestic audience in particular, these are countries, I mean, the, the countries that I'm working in in Central Asia and Russia and in, in the Arabian Peninsula, these are countries that are very skilled at manipulating sort of media narratives. Uh, so there, there's a way that they can push against uh, any sort of team's failure to, to, to reshape that narrative and say, okay, let's look at it in a different way. Uh, so just one, one small example from the World Cycling Championships that were held in Doha in uh, 2016. No, yeah, 27. No, let's let's think about this. 20, 2017. 2016. 2016 was when I was there. So, the um, the Qataris, as as part of hosting the event, they had to they had to demonstrate that they had a commitment to local sport and investing in local sport. And this is this is something that a number of these organizations do as well. Uh, but in in the end, only one Qatari rider actually participated uh, in the men's in the men's field, and then the two juniors they didn't like they they didn't even finish the race uh, first race that they started and the second race they didn't um, they didn't show up to the start line. So here, this is, this is something that the government was able to reorient away, that attention away from that, and say, look, we're investing in sport in other ways, and we're promoting it by having this big uh, bicycling, bicycling event for all these expats, and they completely diverted that narrative to show how they were investing in sport in a different way. So 
There were also major problems, which I think we are about to see happen in Russia, uh, with getting spectators to that particular mm. event. Absolutely empty, astonishingly empty, and an embarrassment. Uh, so the, for the for the Qataris with cycling, that's not such a big deal. They are not going to make that. They're not not going to take that risk when it comes to the World Cup. Uh, and in fact, they already have a practice, a well-established practice, of hiring workers uh, to go to these stadiums to fill the stadiums uh, and to don the dishdasha, uh, the traditional dress, to make them look like they are locals. So they are already thinking about strategizing in terms of filling the stands. Uh, so that is another important point that, uh, you know, even if they don't succeed uh, and Russia's team doesn't succeed, that sort of portrayal of, um, of how, the, how, how filled it is, how popular the event is, is something that, uh, that, that they need to be aware of. And the Qataris are thinking about, I don't know that Russia is, is, is able to do much with that. In Central Asia, in Kazakhstan and in Turkmenistan, they also have a similar problem getting fans to attend. Uh, and in many cases, they ultimately end up giving out tickets for free. Even then, they're still in Kazakhstan, for example, they still couldn't get enough people to fill the stadiums. In Turkmenistan, they will, they make people go. Um, so th there are other ways of doing this, but I think that the, for the domestic audience, it's easier to recraft that, that media narrative. For the international audience, I think that is, that is a really important interesting piece of the story uh, because in some contexts, I mean, Kazakhstan is the place I know best, there has been for a really long time a sense that their control over the media narratives could somehow be pushed out to the international media. Um, and they, they try their hardest, uh, but, but it rarely is, is it successful. And I think that's, that's in large part um, because of the activism of certain groups like Human Rights Watch, among others, to push back and say, no, we have control over this narrative, and we are going to use that to, to highlight these, um, these sorts of things that, the, that, that are against the grain of what the government wants to promote. Uh, so in terms, of, in, in terms of Russia's team success, I, I, would, I would expect that the, the local media would be just completely reorienting the discussion somewhere else. But. Thanks. Oh, stick one here. Yep. Hi. I'm Wen Chi Chen from Baruch College, and I just want to correct Gabrielli there, there for a second. Japan actually got to Ronald 16, 2002. Um, oh, <laughs> um, no, a, a question about Russia. I know they're really bad right now. And why didn't the Russian government or the Russian FA do more to prop up the national, te national team? Since you can see that the Saudi FA signed a deal with La Liga to send like nine players to, to La Liga. And why didn't do such a measure to you know, prop, up the, prop up the national team? So I think um, I did. I think that there's, there's two answers to that. Um, one is that it's, that's more of something that you know, shows results down, down the road, right? The, the Qataris have, have done that too. They, they actually own a football club in Belgium and a football club in Spain. They send young players there. They've invested high, heavily in their under 20 team because they'll be the backbone in 2022. Um, Russia, became really, really bad from, you know, went from being a decent team to being a really bad team very, very, um, it's happened very quickly. You know, they've kind of driven off a cliff. The other problem, and this is something you hear a lot between the Russian fans, is that um, Russia implemented a limit on the number of foreigners per, per club. Um, it's, I think it's four or, or, or five that you can field at any one time. The rest have to be Russian players. And the thinking was, this is great because our Russian players are going to go and uh, um, they're, they're going to get more playing time and they're going to improve and so on. But what happened was Russian players became, or halfway decent Russian players, became extremely valuable because you couldn't just go and buy a bunch of Brazilians to make your team better. So one of the arguments is that a lot of these guys are, are soft, that they're sort of coddled um, as a result. They make so much money. They've got no real reason to go and play in some of the big Western European leagues. Um, and obviously, again, despite the impression that we often have of Russia, there is no sort of central mandate that can command people to go, no, you have to go play in Germany and you go play in the Premier League or, or whatever else. So it's created a situation where what was thought of as, as, as a good positive step has probably backfired 
because a lot of these guys, and, and they get paid decent, get paid pretty good money in Russia, and they have no reason to, to leave or measure themselves against, um, against uh, foreign players. Great. Yes. Uh, hi, uh, Harold Rodriguez. I'm an attorney here in New York City. Um, uh, I, I'm sure you uh, all are following the, um, the recent trial that took place in Brooklyn, the corruption trials of the, like a lot of the uh, Latin, former heads of Latin American uh, soccer um, uh, federations. And I think one of the things that came out of that, um, the, the, the testimonies there, is it's almost been established, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but my impression certainly was that it's practically been established that corruption was at, was at play in the bidding process, in the voting process for, for both Russia and Qatar, especially, particularly Qatar. They delineated through their testimonies how the vote process went, how it was basically just trading votes amongst the, uh, the favors amongst, between the Qataris and the Latin American, the South American uh, CONMEBOL uh, heads. So my question is, why is there, ha, maybe I've missed something here, why is there, has there not been a more forceful reaction from FIFA to this really damning testimony. Why has Infantino, who was not in FIFA at the time, who, you know, he could plausibly say, well, I was not a part of this, but I'm shocked as a matter of public policy. Why has he not taken a more forceful reaction to this really damning testimony as a, simply as a matter of public policy? Um, is it fear of litigation? Is it something else on the part of Qatar? I'm not really sure, but at the very least, I would have expected to hear a little bit, you know, at least some kind of um, talking points from FIFA on this. And Great. Uh, let's actually take a few questions here and we'll come back to the panel. Um, you had some over here? Yep. Yeah. We'll Hi. Um, my name is John McGee. I go to Xavier High School. And the question was, it's probably best for Jane, but I think everyone could kind of say something about it. We talked a lot about how the IOC and FIFA especially are pretty terrible, but we have some kind of hope for them growing. How do we actually hold them accountable? Mm -hmm. Because we're talking about the media can take a look and see when they're doing something wrong. We can hold them accountable. But like, what do we actually do? Do I stop watching the World Cup? Because I don't want to do that. Like, <laughs> yeah, that would be drastic. Yeah. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. Uh, there and then in the back, and we'll, we'll do that as first batch, and we'll come back to you next batch. Yeah. Uh, so some of you mentioned the overwhelmingly negative national economic repercussions of hosting these massive sporting events. Um, however, given the glimmer of opportunity of heightened investment from abroad and modern infrastructure's possible uh, benefits in the realm of trade, are there any success stories of countries emerging as healthier economies or healthier political entities? If not, is it even possible to, to reap possible economic growth from such events? And what specifically could host nations capitalize on to spur this growth? Great question. Thank you. Back. Um, hi, uh, my name is Sarah Stone and I'm a student uh, in the Urban and Social Policy Program here at SIPA. I've done a little bit of research on um, sports and politics in Israel-Palestine and um, kind of Israeli sports league as integrative or subversive vis-a-vis uh, -vis Palestinian athletes who are citizens of Israel who play in those leagues. Um, and I have a question specifically about the, the political role of, 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 of international and local national athletes in these mega events. Um, as political actors, as political agents, or political subjects, and essentially how the arena, we kind of talk about the process in which these arenas are built, but the political space that is created really also kind of physically within the arena um, as a vehicle for political activism or, or, or lack thereof, or co-option. Co um, and, okay, that's question number one, so the, the, the role of, of of the athlete as a political agent, and secondly, um, not sure how related this is, but I'll ask anyways. Um, there's been a lot of talk recently about the uh, integration of the North Korea, South Korea of women's um, hockey team, not the men's hockey team, the women's, um, and I guess kind of following on, on that question of, of the, the athlete as a, as, as, as a political agent, um, um, if you could kind of touch on, on the upcoming um, Olympics also in South Korea. That, Okay, that's a lot. So I'll ask the panelists to take the questions that they prefer, and I'll try and keep tabs and make sure they're all sort of addressed or answered. So Natalie, you want to take first? Oh, okay. All right, thanks. That, that was a, a great series of questions. 
Uh, so I'll, I'll just kind of go one by one and, and try to be as brief as possible. So why hasn't FIFA made a for, more forcible reply to uh, to the the corruption accusations? I mean, so a lot of what Gabe touched on we know from the Garcia report, and that was that was really only released like when it was clear that it was going to be released. Uh, outside of their will, so it was better to just do it then. Um, they don't, I, I, in my read of things, they, they don't want to call more attention than necessary to this particular scandal, and so I, my sense was that if they, can, if they can pull it back from the international sort of attention, then it's better that way, but certainly uh, I, I think there is fear about letting, letting uh, letting the, the organization come under too much scrutiny in large part because, uh, yes, I think the legal element is there, but it also, to me, is really about the money. Um, and if you are running this entire model that is making the, the top folks millions of dollars, and if, if that is challenged in any sort of systemic way, that, that is something that they, that, that, the, the people in charge are not going to be fond of. So if that comes out, I, I can imagine that, that that in itself would be a really good reason to keep this, keep, to try and keep this out of the international eye. Um, so in terms of the other question. So should I just oh, yeah, piggyback on that? And then sure. um, I, I think what, what I would add to that too, and people often forget this, is Sepp Blatter did not want Qatar to get the 2022 World Cup. It wasn't his choice. He could have, um, and again, it's a question of timeline, but when the Garcia report came in, there was no evident smoking gun, uh, or, or certainly that was their reading of it. And if you read it afterwards, you see a lot of stuff, is there enough to, to move away, um, to actually strip somebody of a, of a World Cup? I think if he had really wanted to, he could have, he could have stripped Qatar, because there, there, were, there, there are certain provisions in the FIFA statutes. The problem was he was facing re-election as well. Mm -hmm. And there was enough ill will uh, against him. So I think he made a very much a political choice. And it was also problematic for him on another level is that there were so many flaws with the voting that you couldn't strip Qatar of their World Cup without stripping Russia. And already at that point, Russia was three, four years away. And it would have been really difficult, really politically unpopular. It may well have cost him his role as FIFA president, which he's extremely attached to, or was. Um, by the time Infantino came in, there's nothing you could do about, just not enough time to go get, uh, to, to go get another host. And, um, and, and I think they made this decision and he was, and maybe I'm gullible here and I'm giving him the, the benefit of the doubt, but very realistically, you can't, you couldn't have moved away at that point. Yeah, and, and if you if you read the Garcia report, you see a, a lot a lot of what Jane was talking about about the the, the lack of really stringent application of, of standards of investigation. I mean, it, it's it's almost comical uh, the, yeah. the the degree to which they they call it an investigation and, and the lack so, of cooperation yeah. they had from from a lot of these actors who simply refused to testify. Yeah. Some of them they couldn't find. Mm. Um, sorry. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, and, and you think about you think about the um, oh, I can't remember his right, name right now, but the, um, uh, the 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 Russian sports scientist who is the whistleblower on Ruchenko. the doping scan. Yeah, Ruchenko. Like, if if you look at his situation, you look at that culture of fear, uh, not only applied to the athletes, but also to to various officials within the sort of sports apparatus. You can you can also imagine that 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 you're not going to get that sort of cooperation from these agencies that are that are that are seeking to do any any form of investigation. Um, all right, so I just want to quickly touch on some of the other the other questions about the economic opportunities in in particular. I mean, I I'm sure you might know more about this. The, the last I had read, really, the, the the only truly economically successful Olympic Games were the 1932 LA Games. Um, that was a really long time ago, and th there I think. I think it becomes really difficult to actually evaluate and measure and what sort of things are you are you accounting for when you're going to say one event is an economic success. Uh, so again, then it comes to a question of the, an economic success for whom? Uh, for those construction companies in Kazakhstan and in Russia and, and, and across Qatar, 
it is a success. And I would actually also say that it's a success for a lot of those workers. I mean, even, even if they are not getting paid the, the, the wages that they deserve, they are also nonetheless able to make money, and this is why they keep going. Um, so, so I think the question is really who's benefiting rather than to what extent are they benefiting. Um, but how can countries sort of shift and think about this differently, obviously with the Olympic Games and the bid for 2024, um, uh, and thinking, thinking from then on that we should prioritize cities that have the infrastructure uh, is, is a way to try and bring people back into the loop. Um, so uh, just, just briefly on the, the, the political role of athletes as, um, as agents, I, I think the, the example that you touch on in terms of Israel-Palestine is, is a really interesting case and certainly we see, um, we see a lot of potential for that. Will, will that necessarily happen on the field in Russia, I am skeptical, but I do think that we will continue to see things like the activism that we saw around Sochi um, for various sort of activist communities that are being suppressed in that particular context. Uh, but it is, you're in a much more vulnerable position, I would argue, as an athlete on a field, especially if you want to continue your career as an athlete for that national team or for your own national team if you happen, to, if your country happens to be friends with that host. Um, so, so I think there's a lot of really big political questions that athletes are facing uh, when, when deciding how to express their activism and how to express uh, their opposition to certain, uh, to certain issues. So I, I've been talking for a while. So no, no. So. Jane, I was wondering if you could address the question about the, the, the sort of what, what do we do? Because you yeah. must get this a lot, right? What is it? Hey, human Rights Watch doesn't like the Olympics. It doesn't like the World Cup. You know, what, I'm, you know. I'm, I'm semi joking. We're sports fans. I mean, we you're love sports it. fans. Yeah. How, how do you we respond want them to, to be that? clean? That's right. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think it's it's actually a really difficult question. Um, so, I mean, uh, in print. As an organization, Human Rights Watch doesn't call for boycotts. Other organizations do that, but we don't see that um, as the answer because boycotts end up hurting a lot of people that actually don't have um, any power to change the situation, like the athletes, um, like the fans. So, um, but we, you know, certainly see that as a as an activist tool. We wouldn't ever tell someone not to do that, but that, you know, that isn't something that we do. Um, you know, I think that again, you know, any efforts that people can make, like as a you know as a political constituent, I know with FIFA, um, we had um, a congressman, uh, sorry, a senator from New Jersey, who um, inspired by the allegations of exploitation of workers, um, you know, wrote several letters to FIFA, you know, I think those, anything like that, I mean, it seems kind of sort of out of nowhere a little bit, maybe, but um, I think all of those things that put these federations on notice, that people are watching, and that people of power, whether it's, you know, senators in countries that have, have a lot of authority in these, in these, um, in these federations, um, all of that is important. You know, so the work that, you know, human rights groups do or, you know, I was just thinking back to Sochi that some of the um, ethnic populations that were historically present in that part of Russia and had been subject to deportation um, and, and, and other crimes, you know, seized on Sochi to sort of make their voices heard. I think, you know, anything that a citizen can do to support that, um, you know, it can go a long way, even though it feels really far. Um, and I, I just wanted to say one comment on sort of the athlete activism. Um, I'm not sure what FIFA's rules are, but you know the IOC explicitly prohibits athletes from making political mm. statements. Um, and you know we don't take a particular position on that because athletes don't have human rights responsibilities. But um, you know athletes who do consider speaking out, they basically can risk their entire um, career. Mm. They can be um, disbarred by the IOC. So. Mm. Could be good. Oh, we'll do one more, more around. Let's bundle some final final fights. You've been so patient. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you very much for the presentations. My name is Tomás Napoleão. I'm a diplomat in the Brazil to the UN, and like any good Brazilian, I'm a football fan. I call it football and soccer, and I'll be in Russia for the World Cup. I have a comment that will lead to a question uh, to any of you who would like to uh, respond. I wonder if it's really unique of. Um, let's say, uh, so-called authoritarian or liberal countries to host these large prestige sporting events as a means to, to promote their image. 
uh, across the world. If you think about, for instance, 1992 in Barcelona, the Summer Olympics, uh, essentially uh, reinvented the image of the city of Barcelona. That's when Barcelona be became a, a major tourist destination. Uh, Athens, 12 years later, tried to do the same thing, maybe not so, not so successfully. Uh, that's definitely what we tried to do in Brazil with the World Cup and then the Rio Olympics. Uh, before that, Germany and South Africa also sort of projected a very positive image with their respective World Cups and even specific U.S. cities like Salt Lake City with the mm -hmm. Winter Olympics, then Atlanta before that with the Summer Olympics and, and so on. Uh, so uh, my question is, putting aside for a moment these um, corruption concerns which are very, val very uh, valid, valid and you all mentioned FIFA for a reason, a good reason, but putting aside that for a moment, uh, isn't it normal? I mean, isn't it the, maybe the primary reason why uh, countries and cities, irrespective of their political orientation, so to say, decide to host these very expensive games in the first place? Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions before we go to panel final thoughts? Yep. Um, there one back there. Hi, uh, I'm from CUNY Graduate Center. Um, my question is uh, on the Brazil, FIFA, World Cup, and the Olympics. I saw on TV that those stadiums that they build in states far, far away, they're like abandoned. And nobody uses them. And they just, the day the game finished, that was it. And, and everybody knows about all the evictions that took place, uh, especially in Brazil games. Thank you. Great. And Last question over here. Yep. Hi, I'm John Miranda, a political science student at Fordham University downtown. Uh, my question is about 2022 Beijing. Um, Beijing having uh, hosted 2008, kind of kicking off this string of, I guess, more illiberal um, nations stepping in to host mega events. Is um, I guess this is more for Jane. You see China being more, I guess, mindful of uh, more intense scrutiny um, of these mega events and of the confederations um, from a human rights standpoint um, going into 2022. Do you see anything changing compared to 2008 uh, this time around? Great, super. So why don't we have one last pass? Why don't we just go in the ordering table here? We'll start with you, Jane, then Natalie, then Gabe can have uh, the final word. Yeah. Um, so yeah, in terms of um, Beijing, um, this is, this is all going to come down to the IOC, I think, the International Olympic Committee. I mean, I think that, that Beijing is going to be the absolute test of, um, of the IOC's commitments to human rights um, and putting them into place. Um, I think that actually what we saw after the Beijing Summer Games um, was a, a massive regression of human rights. I mean, it wasn't a particularly human rights friendly place to begin with, um, but it only got worse. Uh, there were, um, you know, all kinds of incidents at the time of the games, which the IOC did not anticipate. Um, so I think, you know, I think this is a really, you know, I put all those all those scholars out there to put you, you know, on this to look at, you know, the yeah the the difference between what happened in 2008 um, and now the IOC faced with another games um, in China. Um, is are they going to make a difference? I mean, there were people in the IOC who resigned after those games because um, it was it was such a disaster in many ways for the IOC, particularly the restrictions on the media, foreign journalists not even being able to you know get into basic onto basic websites because of the firewalls. So um, yeah, China's not in any better place um, from hosting the Olympics, but this is going to be a great great place to hold the IOC accountable. Mm. Yeah, so uh, I'll touch quickly on the question about whether this is unique to authoritarian countries. No, it's absolutely not. And this is sort of the, how I started my presentation, saying that really this, this idea of using these games for that, for the ends of promoting a particular image is something that, is, that we've long seen in, in um, illiberal as well as liberal polities. That's, that's quite, quite, um, quite established. But, but what we do see is certainly a shift to a, a more an increasing number of authoritarian regimes stepping in, uh, and I would say perhaps um, international sports organizations being more willing to let them uh, take some of these games. But but no, it's certainly it's certainly not unique. Uh, and I, I would say, kind of thinking about this question of 
is there room for change? Is there is there room for uh, some something to shift? I, I do I do think that you know as as much as we uh, as much as we stigmatize, I would say, a country like Qatar that is very internationally aware, very much focused on its on its international reputation, that is actually a really powerful thing to harness. Um, and so we, we do actually see the implementation of a number of new labor standards across Qatar uh, and various organizations in the country. But one other important thing that I noticed in the last years that I've been doing research there that, uh, that we haven't talked about yet today is that in constructing a lot of their new stadiums, they're focusing on sustainability. And this is something that is completely new for the Gulf region. And this is another sort of realm of my own research, is on the introduction of sustainable economies in, in the region. And so they have been uh, using all sorts of international companies, Siemens, for example, uh, to develop their stadiums in a green manner. Uh, whether or not anything can be necessarily green when built in the Arabian Peninsula, I think that's, that's an open question. Uh, <laughs> but nonetheless, it is a way that you start to see that the government has internal this awareness that the international community cares about things like human rights. They care about um, green, uh, greening these sort of unsustainable developments and trying to act on that. Whether it necessarily takes the shape that certain international observers would like to see, uh, that's a different question. But it does reflect that, yes, uh, in, in a lot of ways, you can see that some, some of these states, especially the, the hyper-image conscious ones like Qatar, uh, they, they are affecting some changes. But where that will take us, I'm not sure. Um, the gentleman in the back made a great point about, you know, when it comes to World Cups, anyway, you're building a whole bunch of stadiums, uh, and you got to wonder what's going to happen afterwards. In some ways, with an Olympic, you know, every, every country will have at least one big stadium. You can sort of semi justify it, but um, even in Brazil, for example, it's a football mad country. But you know, they built a World Cup stadium in, in Manaus, mm -hmm. and they built one in uh, I forget the name of the city, but it's in the Pantanal, <laughs> Cuiabá. Uh, those teams don't even have top division football clubs. So there was no point, there was no notion after you built a 40,000 seat stadium that, oh look, the local club team's gonna move in there. Um, and that on the other hand, where it's been a success has been in Germany, for example, different economy, different situation, but all those World Cup stadiums, stadiums that were often built with public money, then the local club moved into them, in some cases they, they leased them, um, and they've done very well economically. This is the trade-off, I think, for a lot of these countries. Uh, it was easy for me when I spoke to the organizers in Brazil, and I said, why are you putting the stadium, a stadium in Manaus in the middle of the rainforest? Um, and they said, because if we only put the stadiums where there were strong club teams that could follow it, then we would only have them in, in Sao Paulo, Rio, Belo Horizonte, and you know, maybe Porto Alegre, one or two other places, whereas we want this to bring this to the whole country. That's obviously a trade-off. It's something FIFA is aware of. They want to move away, or they're talking about moving away from sort of the, the megalomania of, of past World Cups. And in some ways, Russia's doing that. Off the top of my head, I think we're having venues, I think it's 10 venues in nine cities. Mm -hmm. I think the peak was 14 venues in the past. So in some ways, that's a positive. Great. Well, thank you, Natalie. Thank you, Jane. Thank you, Gabe. Uh, on behalf of the Harriman Institute and the Jordan Center, I want to thank uh, the audience here and everyone watching on our YouTube channels. Um, this has been, if it's an experimental event, um, it's been absolutely fascinating. So um, we look forward to uh, seeing all of you and your work in this area going forward. So thanks again for joining us.